Today I want to talk about paleo as biohacking, um, which uh, may be a little bit different than how it's currently portrayed in the press. A lot of the pieces on the paleo diet or the caveman diet in the press are a little bit cartoonish. I'm a little bit responsible for that. Um, but it's, it, it often gets portrayed as uh, macho men eating raw meat straight off the bone, wearing a loincloth, which is pretty silly. Um, but, but that's sort of the way that a lot of journalists uh, portray it. It, it. My book and this approach is actually about something much bigger than paleo or the paleolithic or even just diet, which is starting to take evolution, human evolution seriously when we think about human health. Um, the current state of health recommendations in this country and the world is awful. I mean, so many people are, want to be healthy but are confused by conflicting advice. You know, should I do Atkins? Should I go vegetarian? Health issues, ethical issues, environmental issues, uh, uh, for weight loss or autoimmune conditions, and uh, should I count calories as fat evil? Are there types of fat that aren't evil? Um, there's a lot of mass confusion out there, and there are a lot of eating disorders, uh, clearly obesity, type 2 diabetes. Uh, people are living a long time, but uh, the question is, are they, are they thriving and being healthy? So, so the, the broader concept that I want to talk about today isn't just diet or isn't just the Paleolithic, but starting to, to use our evolutionary past uh, to, to generate really smart heuristics that are probably pretty close to being right um, in, in pretty short order. So, um, uh, so just a few, I'm, I'm sure you guys are very familiar with some principles of hacking or biohacking, and, and I just sort of want to do a comparison between principles of hacking or biohacking um, and, and what this broader paleosphere is doing in, in the health world. So trial and error is very important, hands-on, do-it-yourself, self-experimentation, N equals one, um, experiments, um, and speed, move fast, embrace failure, break things, 80% solutions, um, perfect, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good, resourcefulness, repurposing uh, old features for new uses, accidental discoveries. I, I'm moving very quickly over these because I feel like this audience is probably very familiar with this type of stuff. Um, simplicity, keep it simple, stupid, decentralization, all these hacking principles. What's also cool about these principles is it's actually how natural evolution by natural selection works. It's an amateurish process that isn't concerned with, without any overarching authority. Um, it isn't concerned with theory. Uh, it, organisms are always uh, using whatever bits are lying around to, as material for uh, new, uh, new functions and features. Um, it, it's, it's, a, it's sort of a blind trial and error. Uh, search process, um, and so when we when we when you actually look at this broader paleo movement, whether you call it that word, maybe maybe another word is better: ancestral health, evolutionary health, evolutionary medicine. Um, again, you you have a lot of uh, similar features. You you basically have a lot of amateurs out there who have have said a lot of the top-down advice that we're getting from. Uh, health officials at the USDA or in the government or you know, you know my corporate health program or my uh, health insurance policy don't seem to be working um, and and so maybe it's time to uh, start treating your own health as a do-it-yourself activity because if you want to prevent chronic health conditions there's no magic pill you can take there's no surgery that you can conduct to prevent the onset of obesity and type 2 diabetes and Alzheimer's and things like that. You actually have to take day-to-day -day actions in your daily life to prevent all these things. So in a sense, we're all, we're all biohackers if we want to be healthy. We, ha we have to do it yourself. Um, you know, over the last few years, um, this, this uh, sort of paleo approach has been um, pounding the pavement on things like saturated fat and that a lot of the science on saturated fat has been distorted uh, or poorly conducted, um, mis, uh, publishing biases uh, to, to, to make saturated 
fat look bad. Um, but over the last couple of years of, of iteration of people experimenting with their own blood work, um, with different levels of saturated fat in their diet, uh, people have very quickly realized, wait a second, saturated fat is not this evil thing. 40% of all fats in human breast milk are saturated. About 40% of all the fats in the human body are saturated. We've had saturated fat in our diet for millions of years from bone marrow and brains. So we're, our metabolism is well adapted to uh, uh, metabolizing, to, to harnessing it as, a, as an energy source. Um, so, so, so you see issues like that where this bottom-up open source community is moving much faster than the conventional health authorities. Um, embracing failure, is, you know, there are uh, folks in, in the paleosphere who get into fights about you know, whether eating a legume is going to kill you or not, or give you kidney stones, or uh, rice, or wheat, or a lot of people are talking about gluten-free, okay? Uh, um, is having a little bit, bit of gluten going to uh, cause stomach problems and digestive problems in anyone? Is this overblown? So there may be some areas where this burgeoning movement is wrong. That's okay. People are moving fast, they're experimenting, and they're going to see whether it works or not. Um, we don't have to go through all the rest of these. But, um, so my, my book actually isn't mostly about the Paleolithic, even though it uses the word paleo. And, 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 and so I want to introduce the, the structure that I use um, to, to think about human evolution and any health issue that you want to deal with, not just food, not just movement or anything. So this is a typical sort of singularity chart from Kurzweil on from life to today, the growth of complexity or major transitions um, over, the, over that period of time. And, and so I, I sort of structure my thinking into five main buckets as we think about human evolution from the beginning of life to today. Um, what I call the animal age, or basically from the Cambrian explosion to, uh, to the beginning of the Paleolithic, pre-human, essentially. Um, we can learn a lot from other species and our common ancestry with other species um, about how to be healthy, whether it's food, whether it's movement. Um, then you get the Paleolithic for about 2.6 million years. That's when you get hominins um, and, and humans emerging. Um, then you get the agricultural age. Um, after the agricultural revolution, we domesticate plants and animals. Um, start living in cities, uh, our lifestyles change dramatically, um, the industrial age, and the information age. And, um, and we can use this simple sort of five age, five era framework to super, in really quick fashion, get a, a handle 80% of the way there on pretty much any health issue. So, um, and, and, and start to cut through a lot of the noise that's out there about how to be healthy, right? Should we eat saturated fat? Um, how much sun exposure should we get? How much should we move? And in what ways are the best ways to exercise? And all of these questions that, that just fill the bookstores with diet books and health books and all this nuttiness. It doesn't have to be this complicated. So um, some of the heuristics that we can learn when we look at other species is any health dynamic you want to care, you care about. Thermoregulation, diet, uh, movement, um, anything. The best way to learn about it is to completely forget human beings and just look at other species and compare that dynamic um, across different species. Because as soon as you start talking about humans, everybody, you know, everybody has preconceived notions about how to do it. We, uh, people have a lot of, particularly in food, food is like religion, people have all these identity, um, it, it's a source of identity for a lot of people, and so you can't have an honest conversation about what should I eat or what should I not eat. Um, so so if, if, if you look at our common ancestry with, with other species, um, you can be like, okay, well, there are herbivores, there are carnivores, there are omnivores, and if you go to a zoo, the basic approach that the top zoos in the world take is they use modern science and medical technology to keep the animals alive, but then they mimic the natural habitat and lifestyle of the species in relevant ways, in the most relevant ways. Um, and, and, and so it just depends on the species. You, you want to feed red meat 
and whole prey feeding to the lions and the carnivores, and you want to feed grass to the herbivores or whatever plant species they're adapted to, and omnivores have more dietary flexibility. Um, you know, immediately you, you, you can start to um, realize that, first of all, there's no particular food out there that is necessarily inherently unhealthy. Uh, it, it depends on whether that species is adapted to it. Um, it. Plenty of species are adapted to eating grass. And they have the microorganisms in their extensive stomachs to digest it all. Uh, we, we don't. Um, a second thing that you can learn very quickly um, about uh, health from, from looking at other species, and again, looking at zoos, because that's where we often have the best access to them, um, is the importance of habitat and starting to think about health uh, in, in terms of a holistic habitat-based approach to keeping species healthy. Um, I, I talk about in my book a trip to the Cleveland Zoo where they, uh, they had some obese gorillas. And they were trying, uh, heart disease and heart failure is the number one killer of male gorillas in captivity. Um, just like heart disease is the number one killer of male humans in civilization. Um, and so they were trying to figure out ways to uh, reverse or halt the progression of heart disease in uh, these western lowland gorillas. And it's kind of like, okay, so what should we do? They don't really have any fat in their diet, so low fat doesn't work. Um, I guess they could try to restrict their calories, but that, uh, that didn't seem to make sense. So what they did was they, they were like, oh, wait a second, maybe we shouldn't be feeding these western lowland gorillas uh, wheat, corn, and soy-based fiber bars that are essentially reformulated dog food. Of course, it's not even dog food because that's not what dogs and wolves eat. But um, so they, they switched the gorillas to a, to a bunch of leafy plants and vegetables that they bought in the local Cleveland grocery store. McCullough lost 70 pounds, Beback lost 35 pounds, their blood work improved, behavioral problems went away, um, all sorts of things like that. So, um, but, but all of these zoos realized that um, it's one, you can use modern medical technology to keep the animals alive for a long period of time. Um, but if you want to prevent the onset of chronic health conditions to help them thrive, you, you, you have to take a habitat-based approach because there's no pill, there's no surgery that can be done to reverse these conditions, or at least not terribly effectively. So, so that, that gives you your first pass approach at, okay, how does this dynamic work? Forget human beings. Then, then the next step is to say, okay, well, if we're talking about diet, um, how, how, now, how does this feature uh, manifest in human beings during a formative, a long formative period in human evolution, during the Paleolithic, this 2.6 million year uh, period? It's not the end of the story, but it really is sort of the beginning of the story. That's, I, I don't think that paleo diets and um, paleo this and paleo that is the end of the conversation. It's more like it's the appropriate beginning to the conversation. Um, so, you know, this is, if you were talking about diet, that's where you realize, you talk to paleoanthropologists and realize that humans have been eating meat for 2.6 million years or longer. Um, there are cut marks on bones that we have going back that long. And so, like, right off the bat, you just are immediately skeptical of, of claims that veganism or vegetarianism are the optimal ways for humans to be healthy. Because it's like, wait a second, we've been omnivores for millions of years. Um, there are no known uh, vegan or vegetarian indigenous populations. Um, and the introduction of meat into the human diet is, uh, does appear to be related uh, to, in part, to the expansion of our brains. Um, and, and so the Paleolithic gives you a f this first pass approximation of what might be a healthy lifestyle, healthy diet, um, uh, uh, temperature uh, changes, um, circadian rhythms, sleep patterns, all this. It gives you a first pass approximation of what might be a healthy pattern for human beings today. It doesn't guarantee that there aren't new ways of doing things that are better, or new foods that might be healthier or better. 
Um, but it, 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 for, for the amateur trying to like quickly arrive at, at good heuristics, it's the right place to start. Then after the agricultural revolution, people start living in cities. We become farmers and herders instead of hunters and gatherers. Um, and, and so then you take into account recent adaptations. So just because a food is novel uh, doesn't mean it's bad or unhealthy. Um, so for example, I mean, many of most people's favorite foods come from fermentation, whether it's alcohol or cheese or bread or um, a lot of things uh, harness microorganisms um, and the process of fermentation to be created. So, you know, we can take into account recent cultural adaptations. We can also take into account um, genetic adaptations. You look at alcohol and populations that have been drinking alcohol for 5,000 years um, handle it better than indigenous populations that have had alcohol, have been drinking alcohol for three generations. Um, they're just not adapted to metabolizing uh, to alcohol well. You know, if, if you come from European or Middle Eastern ancestry, um, though our ancestors went through a process uh, where there were probably lots of people dying of alcoholism, but it happened 5,000 years ago. Um, and uh, I won't go too much into this, but one of the heuristics that's very important is realizing the importance of, of culture, both I culture in the forms of ideas and microbes to, to human health. So you, then you get the Industrial Age. And this, the Industrial Age and the Industrial Revolution over the last couple hundred years is, is pretty much a warning of what not to do. This is the simple heuristic here is, um, you know, we, we send uh, the, or the British Navy sends a bunch of sailors out on ships and they alter their food so that it doesn't perish and don't realize that these guys are going to get scurvy because there's no vitamin C um, in what they're eating. Or people move indoors and they don't get any sunlight and then people get rickets, okay? So we kept on, we started changing things in, the, in human lives so quickly during the Industrial Revolution that we weren't able to adapt culturally or genetically. Um, rickets, uh, pellagra, um, uh, scurvy, um, even ex explorers going into novel habitats during the Industrial Age, uh, flight going under, uh, uh, you know, under sea. Um, these were, this industrial technology was literally pushing human beings into habitats that we had never experienced over millions, eons of, of genetic and cultural evolution. Um, and we learned how to kill ourselves. Uh, we killed ourselves at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution through lack of sun exposure um, and, and rickets, through missing micronutrients, changing our diets so quickly and shifting to a diet of refined flour and sugar and alcohol that we were missing key micronutrients from our diet. And then by the sort of the end of the Industrial Age, we figure out that um, we need to add certain things back in and fortified foods with them. But we were just solving problems of our own creation. So the big lesson from the industrial age is learning how to not die, basically. Um, and then today, in, in the information age, we're now in a position to, you know, the, the last piece of this is personal experimentation and customizing solutions to you. Um, so, so let's... let's um, because everybody has a, a unique genome, unique gut bacteria, allergies, injuries, tastes, preferences, budgets. So we're all unique organisms. We all live in a unique habitat. We're all going to end up with somewhat unique diets or lifestyles that, that work for us. So let's, take, um, so let's take food. You know, a lot of people, they hear the paleo diet. They just think of the paleolithic. And the basic prescriptions are um, everybody... Um, all the conventional health authorities pretty much agree that industrial, too much industrial food is bad for you. So all their advice from the Mayo Clinic to Dr. Oz to Michael Pollan to everybody is basically avoid industrial food, processed food, uh, Twinkies and Coca-Cola and refined sugar and, and, and all that. So it basically boils down to Eat like we did before the Industrial Revolution. Eat like you sort of grew up on a farm. And you had whole grain bread and milk and cheese and organic. Everything was organic. Uh, we were still poor, 
but everything was organic. Um, so, so all of that health advice basically boils down to eat like a farmer, eat like a herder farmer. Um, what, what, and that may be enough for a lot of people. That may be enough. Avoiding industrial food for a lot of people, particularly young people, may be completely fine um, and, and sufficient. But it's not for a lot, for a lot of other folks. And, and so what paleo adds to the mix is saying, OK, well, the agricultural revolution introduced two huge food groups into the human diet that basically hadn't been consumed before. Um, grains and, and, and legumes and uh, uh, domesticated seeds, basically, um, and dairy from domesticated animals. I don't know if anybody here has milked a wild animal. It's not easy. It's possible. Not easy. Um, so, so what this adds um, a little more perspective and says, OK, well, um, people 400 generations ago only started to eat tons of wheat and corn. And, um, and, and, and diets shifted from being very diverse, lots of different animal species, lots of different parts of the animal, lots of different types of plants, depending on the geography and the season to a diet heavily concentrated in a few staple cereal crops, uh, wheat, corn, barley, oats, um, and then products made from that, bread and beer and things like that. So, um, so, so, so paleo adds, add, adds that piece um, to the puzzle in, in food. Um, so, so what I recommend people do is, first off, if you feel fine with your health, and the way that you're eating, there may be no reason to change anything. I mean, if, if, if you feel fine and, and there aren't any issues, then, then what's the problem? Um, however, if eating an agricultural diet isn't working for you, then what you might want to explore is this prior period, you know, diets that were more common during this prior period um, in, in human evolution. So removing grains, removing dairy for a time, and, and uh, trying to mimic it, you know, a, an approximation. We realize it's an approximation. Um, and, and then add back in novel modern foods and see how you feel. Um, I know many people who, uh, who are very strict on gluten and grains. Um, many, many have to be. Um, many just want to be. Um, and I know more people who are flex on, on dairy, particularly uh, and when they eat it, it'll be more like full fat traditional dairy. Um, and, then, uh, and then just see how you feel. And this is sort of the biohacking part of it. You've, you've got to experiment. And based on your ancestry and your genome and your gut bacteria and what you like, you just have to sort of craft your own, your own diet. But um, the Paleolithic, let me give you one more example, and then maybe we can go to, to questions. I don't know what time it is. It's about 3.30. 3.30. Um, so take, the Paleolithic doesn't help you with all areas. And this is why I get a little frustrated with the term paleo, even though I use it and promote it. Um, so take sleep as an example. Um, the big change in human sleep patterns didn't happen between the Paleolithic and the Agricultural Revolution. Like, people still lived with their extended family in fairly close quarters. Um, and had no indoor lighting and things like that. Um, the big transition in sleep was between the agricultural age and the industrial age when you get uh, indoor lighting, you get um, more stimulants like coffee and tea to keep people up, uh, more, al you know, um, well, I guess alcohol was way before, um, clocks, um, things like that. that it, and, and then people increasingly sleeping in isolation from others in their own rooms on softer and softer bedding. Um, so so the, most of the, the key transition, when it, uh, the, most of the key changes when it, when it can't, comes to sleep um, have nothing to do with the Paleolithic. And you can actually get an approximation of a healthy way of sleeping um, and sleep patterns from looking at our agricultural era ancestors. Um, so, so the Paleolithic doesn't always hold the solutions to everything. Um, we can. Um, we, we don't always need it, depending on the issue. But people focus on diet um, so much that uh, that's, that's what it get, gets associated with. Um, do I have anything else?
No. Um, so if people now have specific questions, let's open it up to questions. By what? So um, people would uh, sleep uh, near a fire usually. Um, there were lots of people around. There wasn't very much privacy. Um, there are a lot of folks who think that the sleep was l l less of a um, single uninterrupted stretch of seven or eight hours and more broken up into two periods. Or you'd sleep for a while, wake up, have sex, go to the bathroom, uh, chat with someone by the fire, go back to sleep for a few hours. Night was a lot, you know, night was a long time. Um, and you couldn't do much when it was dark. So that's, that's sort of what it was like. But it doesn't seem to have, didn't change too much when people started farming. And then they were living in, you know, little huts with extended family scrunched together around the fire for all night. So. Other, uh, uh, yeah, uh, from from on VC behind you, you can't see me actually. I think. Hi. I want to see this. Yeah. <laughs> um, my name is Amir. I'm actually tuned in from Hamburg, Germany. Um, and uh, thanks again for doing all this. Failure has done a lot for me. Uh, I've listened to you recently on the Rob Wolf again. It's it's just amazing stuff that you guys are doing. So thanks. My question is, so it, it has like I was really metabolic and broken for a lot of long time and I actually have a lot of people around me that are as well. I have a lot of people when you say, you know, when people say they're fine with, with what they're eating and the way they're feeling, then you should let them be in that sense. So the two questions that I, that I have around that is, you know, hey, how do they know that they couldn't feel much, much better, right? I feel like we've been doing that sort of stuff for a long time. We don't even know what it would be without, right? It's like, right, right, handbrake all day, basically, all their lives. So that's the one question. The other one is, I feel like, so you say a lot of young people especially, I think what you mean is that a lot of people, their metabolism is much more forgiving than, for example, later in time. Right. What is the damage, though, that is accumulating over this period, that sort of, you know, um, yeah, lifestyle that could be prevented and would not even lead to, you know, issues in the 30s, 40s, 50s, whatever? So uh, thanks for your questions. For the first question, um, yeah, people tend to accept uh, what, uh, their lives as normal. Um, they confuse the word normal with common. I do it, everybody here does it. Just because it's common in North America to live a certain way doesn't mean it's necessarily uh, um, species typical in a biological sense. Um, so they have the same problem in zoos. They, they run studies on the health of all the captive gorillas in North American zoos, but they actually can't conclude very much because they all li leave very similar lives in very similar circumstances, eating very similar food. And so if you actually want to see real differences in gorilla health, you have to compare them with their wild counterparts. So, but the reason why I don't, um, I say like, if however you're eating, if you feel great, fine, is partly because I don't want to like, push people too much. And we can eat novel foods, and we can live in new ways, and that's fine. So I, I, I just, I'm trying to do more of the soft sell, I guess. Um, but I, I think people would be surprised about how many conditions um, that they accept as normal that aren't necessarily, um, that don't necessarily have to be. Um, you know, you get teenagers that um, accept it as normal that they will need braces and get tons of acne. And this causes like a lot of social anxiety and like self-esteem issues and, and we treat it as this normal sort of like rite of passage through, through adolescence. Um, but the reason why our teeth are crowded is because our, our jaws have gotten smaller um, over the last some thousands of years because the food we eat isn't very tough. It's very soft. And so our jaws don't grow as large as they do when we had tougher foods. And so the jaws aren't large enough to fit all, our feet, all of our teeth. Um, and then when you don't, and, and some of those strong bite forces are what the body uses to help your teeth come in straight. When you look at these hunter-gatherer skulls, and I've gotten to examine some of them, 
80,000 years ago, beautiful set of teeth. Not perfect, but wisdom teeth came in. There was enough room in the jaw for the wisdom teeth to come in. Uh, no cavities uh, and straight. So, so, so that's, now, Sorry, is, yeah. Is that, are you saying that's an evolutionary change over 80,000 years, or is that a specific change over the lifetime because an individual is chewing less that their jaw grows less? Indiv individual chewing less, though there is some, there are, some lines of evidence that maybe the human head has actually gotten a little bit smaller over the last 10,000 years. Our brains, our brains actually used to be a little bit bigger than they are today, um, near the end of the Paleolithic. I don't know what that means. Um, your second question was about, what was your second question? Well, oh, youth, is, youth. Um, so, Definitely young people can, um, there's very interesting evolutionary, the evolutionary bio, biology of aging is a very fascinating area. There's a guy named Michael Rose at UC Irvine who's probably the preeminent guy in this field. Um, and a lot of people think of aging as, as sort of uh, simply just damage accumulating. Um, like a car rolls off the lot um, at, um, you know, at a, at a at a, at a, wherever they sell cars, dealership. at a dealership. <laughs> um, and, and then from then on out, it sort of just accumulates damage. But um, during, during the period of time before the typical age, first age of reproduction, um, we've basically evolved incredible repair mechanisms. So, if, 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 let me put it this way, if you get a genetic defect that causes you to die when you're four or five, your genes don't get passed into the next generation at all. Kaput. You know, it's, you're, you're out. You're out of the gene pool. Um, but if you get that same uh, genetic defect when you're 50, you, can, you still have time to have offspring. So, so basically, depending on the first typical age of reproduction of a species, Evolution selects for incredible, robust health. Um, you know, we grow stronger as we get older. We become more robust, right, at, you know, from, from birth to adolescence, and then we start to accumulate dam damage. So children are, young people are actually probably pretty well adapted to some aspects of an ag agricultural diet. Young people are probably better adapted to some of those foods than those same individuals later in life. It's a very counterintuitive concept. But there's been selection pressures for, for young kids to be able to survive on these diets, to make it to the age at which they reproduce. There has not been the same sort of selection or as strong of selection for older people. So there are a lot of people, for example, um, who end up getting celiac later in life. It just there was some traumatic event or childbirth or just getting older, um, either celiac or not being able to digest lactose. They become lactose intolerant later in life. You start to notice it um, among folks. My, my grandmother developed celiac late in life. Um, and it's possible that for some of these more novel foods, we're better adapted to them when we're young and less adapted to them when we're older. So it may become more important to eat more of a paleolithic diet, the older you get. Some of that is hypothesis. Can, we, can, can I build on that just really quickly, sorry. Well, let, what, okay. Just because there's, it's, it's very, like, it's a very tangible thing, like, for right. Google, Google putting, like, a lot of money into keeping Googlers healthy, right? Right. And they come, like, like, free M&Ms and, 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 and stuff like that? <laughs> <laughs> and then we, then we get massages and like adjustable tables and gyms and that sort of stuff. And you know we have a lot of people that start at around age, I don't know, 20, 25 here. And then as they, as they continue working here, they get out of shape, but they think that's the natural course of life, basically. So what would you tell Google as a company to say, hey, look, your, your people just don't have to get sick and fat? Right. That's right. Well, we can start to model workplaces on little hunter-gatherer tribes and, you know, less clothing and things like that. Um, it, uh, it, when you look at traditional people, indigenous folks living in traditional ways, 
they, they have health problems of their own, infant mortality, things like that, but they tend to live into their 60s, 70s, and even the 80s in some cases in robust health. You know, the 70-year-olds, they're not bedridden with arthritis and have Alzheimer's. They're like carrying pails of water uh, into their 70s and, you know, hiking up hills and things like that. And if, if you were a hunter-gatherer, you had to, at a minimum, be able to move with your tribe whenever it migrated. Um, and uh, so it's, you know, we, it, it gives you a new sense of, of what's, what's normal. What I like about the way that Google thinks about health is really thinking about the habitat. You know, saying, okay, your, your habitat has a big influence on whether you eat something or don't. If we put a cover on it and make it less visible, will fewer people eat the candy? I think that's one of the changes that happened here. Um, and habitat, what's good about re-engineering your habitat is it, um, it doesn't require as much willpower and discipline. So many people, when they, when they get into dieting, they think they're changing themselves. Like, I have to change myself, and I have to become a better person, and I'm going to do this through willpower and discipline. And that's part of the reason why everybody fails at it, is because you, like, you can't, nobody is perfectly disciplined over a long period of time. You have to find ways of um, using discipline in a short period of time to change your habitat so that it makes it easy to be healthy, even when you're not disciplined. Um, or y y the way that you l lead your life, the food you eat and how you move, it has to be meaningful to you in some way. You know, calories are not meaningful to people. People are not, most people are not motivated by calories. Um, you know, um, hunting, but you know, going to hunt a wild animal to you know, big, big, bring back um, you know, a lot of meat to try to impress the girl in the tribe that you like, like that motivated people. So you have to, th you have to think about ways to uh, either change your habitat or make a healthy lifestyle meaningful to people so that it's, it, it doesn't require discipline. Um, cutting, uh, one thing people will notice with abrupt changes is particularly around sugar. People eat a lot of sugar today and if you eat a lot of sugar and then you cut it out of your diet, you're basically going through withdrawal of a drug and it's not pleasant. Lightheadedness, shaky hands, inability to concentrate, um, anxiety, uh, so that can be difficult. Um, the, it, unless somebody has a, like, some sort of specific severe health issue, um, I do tend to think that trying to go more or less whole hog for a short period of time is the best way to do it. Um, and you just got to monitor how, how you feel. Um, you'll see better results or you'll have a better validation of whatever results you get. Um, and, uh, and you can harness that period of discipline. You know, a lot of people can be disciplined for a week or two weeks. Few people can just be disciplined for two years. Um, so rather than trying to go sort of 50% for a long period of time, just going 100%. Um, other risks, um, with diet, I don't think there are as many risks. With exercise, yeah, people, if people just like immediately jump into a hard CrossFit workout without learning Olympic lifts, you can injure your back. Um, so, but for most people, sugar is the biggest immediate obstacle. So, um, I'm vegan, and I actually agree a lot with the paleo um, 
mindset. Mm -hmm. Eating, I think there's a lot more in common than there is. I agree. As far as um, focusing on whole foods, etc. Um, so I was just curious. Then there's scientific, and I think it gets overblown in the media how much meat you do have to eat. Um, I think too much is bad. I don't think necessarily it's not. It's um, the, you know the only way to do things. So I was just curious, kind of, this, I guess your thoughts on diet, maybe your uh, day to day diet. Well, l let me talk about the vegan paleo thing for a sec. In, in the press, it's often portrayed as polar opposites. I do tend to think of paleo and vegan as more like yin yang. Um, the, uh, you know, I have, I have no problem with people eating however they want to eat. And I respect vegans and vegetarians a lot for, the, for being conscious eaters. Um, where it, it does grate on me a little bit is if, if people then turn around and say, this is an optimal human diet. Um, that's, where, that's where I become a bit more combative and, and disagree. Um, the, and, and here's the thing, any dietary approach, Atkins, vegan, paleo, whatever, that gets people to eat less industrial food is gonna work to some extent. Less refined, you know, sugar, refined sugar, refined flour, high fructose corn syrup. Any approach that gets people to reduce that will have some success, at least for a time. Um, and then, you know, I have much more in common with how uh, with how vegans eat than um, than probably the average Western diet. Um, what was the last piece? How do I eat on a daily basis? I often don't eat breakfast. Um, I don't wake up terribly hungry. Um, sometimes if I do have breakfast, I'll have some eggs and spinach, or I'll have a bowl of heavy cream because I eat some dairy, um, and a sliced up banana, which is delicious. Um, lunch, uh, sushi, I don't worry about a little bit of white rice or anything like that. Um, uh, sushi, sashimi, uh, Mongolian barbecue, meat and vegetables, a cob salad, something like that. Um, and then dinner would be a piece of fish, sweet potato, and a side salad. I mean, it's not that, it's not that radical. Um, but it, it is radical over an extended period when, you're, when you realize that gluten and corn, you know, wheat and corn are in everything. Um, in the grocery store, except for a few things around the outside. Question from Macy behind you. Hi. Hi. Um, um, so you mentioned white rice, and I eat uh, white rice myself because I think it doesn't, at least it doesn't feel as bad as wheat does. Um, so, and I've also read some studies saying that among grains, you might actually be better off eating white rice than brown rice even, um, in moderation. Um, so thoughts on that? And I'm going to throw in a second question, which is, uh, you mentioned metabolism as uh, you know the, one of the thing, uh, the, the damage analogy for aging. Um, so, you know, the, the simple logic is that the more, the faster your metabolism, the faster you're going to age. But then again, I find like, for instance, if I sleep on a cold, hard bed, I feel better in the morning, and I feel like logically, I feel like that's the better thing to be doing. But then part of me is thinking, well, isn't my body trying to burn more fuel to stay warm during the night? So. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Um, well, on rice first, I, I do tend, in my mental model of, of grains, wheat is the worst and rice is the least worst or the best. Um, the, let me give you the 10,000 foot view of seeds. And when I say seeds, um, I mean the reproductive organ of the plant and I'm including grains, legumes, nuts, and seeds. Seeds, uh, as the reproductive organ of the plant, um, are, have many nutrients in them because it's to feed the, the next generation. They also have uh, defense mechanisms. Usually, um, sometimes a shell, which is nature's way of saying stay out, um, or uh, chemicals, toxins, or naturally occurring pesticides. Plants can't run away from predators. They are not mobile. So they have to use other mechanisms to defend their offspring or their reproductive interests. And they usually do that by making seeds or the entire plant toxic in some way to insects or herbivores. They might be okay, they, I'm giving them 
uh, agency, as metaphorically, but um, it, they might be okay with uh, an herbivore coming along, eating their seeds, and then not digesting them, and then letting them come out in their feces, but they're, they're still then covered in a casing to prevent them from being digested. Um, uh, lots of wild almonds contain cyanide in them. Um, apple seeds also have cyanide in them. Many fruit pits are poisonous. Um, and if, if every year, you know, some kid will eat like a peach pit or a nectarine pit and have to go to poison control or die. Um, it, there are, you, you basically go through seeds and it's a huge list of things that can irritate the stomach or the reproductive system of the animals that are consuming them. Uh, sheep uh, in New Zealand and Australia, you have to keep them away from certain pasture legumes because if the ewes eat too many of them, they have higher rates of miscarriage or become infertile, which is uh, an adaptation. That's exactly what the legumes want to do because it, it, any, any ewes that have a taste for them don't have offspring. Um, so there's a general um, concern with eating diets that are high in seeds, um, particularly the same seed over and over, um, because they can cause a lot of health problems in concentrated qualities, um, and if they're not prepared in traditional ways. Traditional ways of preparing nuts and seeds and grains and legumes, soaking, uh, fermenting, uh, baking, um, uh, sprouting, all of these traditional methods of preparing seeds were ways of deactivating some of these problematic toxins in them, and we've sort of forgotten that. And now we just eat tons of, of wheat, corn, and soy prepared in untraditional ways, and so that's, that's the main reason for being skeptical of them um, from the outset. White rice is basically carbohydrate. If you want more carbohydrate in your diet, eat it. If you want less, don't. I like the texture of it. I, so I eat it, <laughs> and I can handle the carbohydrate. What was your other question? Uh, it was about uh, whether increasing metabolism by wearing oh. clothing or exposing yourself to the cold is a good thing because then you know, the whole aging argument. Yeah, I, I don't, I'm not sure I have a very good answer to that question. Um, I don't know how much. Uh, is trying to slow down your metabolism is feasible and how much it might or might not add to your longevity at the end of your life. Is it an extra 20 days when you're 87 years old? I don't know. Um, so I, I would do whatever, um, if, if you get better sleep on a harder surface when it's chilly, then, uh, then I would I'd do that. And yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Um, I'm personally really glad I do paleo, and I feel fortunate that I can because there's a farmer's market that I can go to, and I, I have the wherewithal to buy expensive grass-fed beef, and I live in a country that gives me an internet where I can go and I read your blog and like listen to podcasts. Is there a future for paleo like in Africa or in uh, Southeast Asia? Is, is there a future where billions of people around the world are eating paleo? and? Can we sustain that? And um, what, That's, or is it just sort of like a fad that like upper middle class right, people in America right. are going to embrace? Well, um, we can learn a lot about human health even if everybody in the world does not adopt this diet, which they won't. Even if, even if everybody had the capability to do so, everybody wouldn't. Um, so first, the benefit of some people experimenting with this is simply uh, learning about human metabolism and, and what makes folks healthy. Um, there, right now, the, the early years of paleo, people are, are painting with, with broad strokes. Grains are bad. Well, maybe it will turn out over years of research that um, gluten grains are the worst, but if, if you're dealing with non-gluten grains, quinoa or something else, you know, many people can digest that better. Or maybe we'll learn that um, you just need to introduce certain types of gut bacteria into people's stomachs and then they have fewer negative reactions to a particular grain. So um, 
there, there may be changes in how we think about paleo or how we think about different grains that make it more accessible to people or, or make aspects of paleo irrelevant. Um, you mentioned the insect company or the cricket uh, protein bar company that I'm helping out. Um, uh, we're, insects are eaten as a nutritious and inexpensive source of protein all over the world, uh, mostly except for the Western world. Um, but even uh, crickets, grasshoppers, and locusts are fine under kosher and halal rules. Um, and there's really no good reason other than a sense of disgust and tradition, a recent tradition, uh, to avoid eating insects and taking advantage of them. Um, they, the amino acid, pro, amino acid profile of insects is beautiful, most of them. Um, you don't have to sort of mix, mix and match protein sources. Uh, the, they require fewer resources to raise, um, water in particular. Um, and f for ethical reasons, they have a less well-developed uh, neurological uh, system and are adapted to living in very close quarters. So, so that's, that's an area where paleo could actually um, make, in some respects, make it uh, make healthy eating more sustainable. Um, but no, is, is everybody going to live off of grass-fed beef? No, but it, you, know, you have a small group of people making innovations and it also incentivizes the big players, the big agricultural companies, to start to make changes to how they do things. And they can make small tweaks in their supply chain or in their treatment of animals um, that can have a huge difference on the environment and on ethical issues simply because they're now responding to a 2% of the market, 3% of the market, 5% of the market that is profitable and growing that they want to get in on. So, did you? Seems like this has like kind of a question related to maybe some certain things, maybe to other things. All right. Like when we look at that, the line from like paleo up, like the, the idea of like agricultural societies fared better because they made cheaper milk. Like that's why, it's an evolutionary process also. Like right, it was growth. Right. Well, we, right now there are enough calories to feed everyone and the main impediments are institutions and infrastructure and, and you know, growth in poor parts of the world. Um, but if more people continue to eat meat, um, you know, that does take more resources and things like that. Um, the, the problem with corn or soy or any of these grains as protein sources is they're not very good protein sources. They're incomplete um, and eaten in large quantities, they can cause health problems too. So, um, you know, I, I don't know all the details of the ins and outs of, of the resources required to grow insects. We're sort of exploring that right now. Um, but it's, it's worth exploring, I think. What's the ideal food uh, the hacking that, uh, that's a pretty big around? I was wondering, um, let's say my ideal state for my grandchildren is that they eat fringes and fries all day, and they live to 100 and they don't have any problems. Uh, what about experimenting in that direction? How to better you know, work on a cheaper diet of fast food? Right, well. Then move back towards an expensive diet of a very good quality food. Like, would, would we want a million years from now everybody to just, you know, well, that will never happen. Well, I mean, evolution takes time. It takes a, it takes many many generations. Well, 
Well, it, it, it's this is this is an area where I'm I'm probably in a little bit of tension with some of the folks here or the tech world, is there throughout history you have engineers who are very hubristic and think that they can centrally plan and design things better than um, you know better than nature does or, or better than a decentralized process does, and many times they can, then occasionally they fail magnif magnificently. Um, you know, so yes, we can produce more calories with, uh, with wheat and corn and feed more people and we can adapt to that somewhat over periods of generations, but it also exposes you to famine. You basically didn't have famine until we became heavily dependent on a few cereal grains and, w and in a sense we put all our eggs in one basket. Um, Well, because hunter-gatherers tend to have ver have more diverse uh, diets than than other people, and they're nomadic. So when you have a more diverse portfolio, you're less likely you're less dependent on any one uh, food source. Um, if it fails, it's it's not catastrophic. And if you're nomadic, you can quickly up and move. So um, it's well established among among anthropologists that um, it's it's not to say there weren't periods when uh, People ran out of food or, or um, you know, went hungry, but famine shot up when we, when we started betting on a few cereal grains. And if you didn't get enough rain, or if you didn't store enough grain, boom, you're done. You're wiped out. There were a lot more people to starve, yes, because the you know, population is closer to agriculture. But the Inuit, for example, starved regularly up until the, um, you know, until they integrated into the modern age and to the rest of the world. Um, I don't know details on that, but I bet I would disagree with you on that. Like Soylent, like yeah, that just raised. No, 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 no. Uh, it, so you only get you only get evol you only get um, adaptation um, if. People have, if there's differential reproductive success, um, if some people are having more babies and, and other, other people aren't. So um, you, you would need, over a very long period of time, you would need the people that are thriving best on uh, heavily industrial diets to also have the most children. Um, I mean, maybe the Chinese are willing to do an experiment like that, but <laughs> not in like a democratic society and it and it requires i mean um even lactose tolerance is only only moved to is only in about 30 it's one gene that had enormous benefits one gene enormous benefits and it only moved to about 35 percent of the population in a six or seven thousand year period that is, that's like the most rapid example that we have of something with one gene that needs to be flipped enormous benefits and even over a you know 7000 years or whatever it's 35% of global population so um, it's it's not feasible to think that we're going to change through well it, it, there are other mechanisms i mean you know bill gates has been investing in our you know it, artificial meat sources, um, there are bioengineers working on, um, there, there may be ways of, of engineering bacteria or harnessing bacteria to basically digest um, inedible food sources for us and then we can digest the, 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 the output. Um, so I think we're gonna, that's where the innovation will happen. Um, not so much in whether we change our own genome or anything like that. So we're actually over oh. time now. Yeah. Um, can you stick around a little bit? Sure, yeah. I'm, uh, I can hang. We're going to stick around if you have any expressions. But thanks for coming, John. The book's in the back, $10, subsidized by Google. Check it out. It's an awesome book. Thanks, John. Cool. Thank you.